see what's sure about it. Hello, everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us. I'm Mark Levine, Chair of the City Council's Health Committee. Uh, we're going to be joined in a moment by my co-chair for this hearing, which is Carlina Rivera, Chair of the Hospitals Committee. And I'm pleased that we are also joined by fellow Health Committee members, Dr. Matthew Eugene from Brooklyn and Councilmember Keith Powers from Manhattan, and it looks like we are about to be joined by Councilmember Antonio Reynoso from Brooklyn. Welcome all. <coughs> the alarmingly fast rate of increase in health care costs has been a source of enormous concern in New York and nationally for many years. The U.S. spends more per capita on health care than any other developed nation, and will soon be spending close to 20% of GDP on health. It's not that Americans are buying more healthcare overall than other countries. It's that what we are buying is increasingly expensive. Today in this hearing, we want to focus on a subset of this vexing problem, the fact that some healthcare providers in the city stand out with costs that exceed even the, even the already high rates of their peers. Recent news coverage and several studies have shown that costs for similar procedures can vary widely between different hospitals in New York City. And this hearing will explore the extent to which rapid consolidation of the hospital sector in New York has accelerated the trend towards price increases, with the largest systems now acquiring such strong negotiating power that they can block insurance contracts that steer patients to lower cost providers. We will also examine the extent to which costs are being inflated by the opaque way that hospitals and insurance companies price their services, a problem exacerbated by the hidden details and agreements between insurers and providers. The wealthiest New Yorkers can indeed afford the most expensive care. But for working people, runaway costs are inflicting a heavier and heavier burden. This is particularly true for workers and their families who receive their health coverage from a labor union health fund, where high health costs inevitably lead to lower salaries. To that, to that end, we are watching with great concern the ongoing negotiations between New York Presbyterian and Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield, a dispute that could impact the health care of no fewer than 300,000 New Yorkers. So we have some high stakes questions to explore in this hearing, and I very much look forward to our discussion, and thank you all for being here today. I think that Councilmember Rivera is coming in in a second, but I, I, I will ask uh, our first panel to, to uh, make their way to the table, which will be uh, Miguel Santos, okay. yep. Sarah Rothstein, Kyle Bragg, Edward Kaplan, and I'm sorry if I'm mispronouncing this, Richard Lorio? Iorio. Okay. Okay, welcome, Chair Rivera. Thank you. Pleasure to be co-chairing this hearing with you, and I'm going to turn it over to you for your opening statement. Great. Thank, Thank you. you so much, everyone. Um, 
Good afternoon, I'm Councilmember Carlina Rivera. I'm chair of the Hospitals Committee, and I want to thank my colleague, of course, Councilmember Mark Levine, chair of the Health Committee, for jointly chairing this hearing with me this afternoon. As Chair Levine mentioned, data shows that the United States spends more on health care than any other country in the world, with costs that vary widely between institutions and can often be convoluted and complex to understand. There are multiple studies that speak to the enormity of these issues, including a study based in California that focused on the varying cost of appendectomies throughout the state. The study found that the cost of this particular procedure ranged from as little as $1,529 to as much as $182,955 within the state. Notably, prices varied more by individual institution than their geographic region. Today, we'd like to discuss why the cost of a service in one hospital in the city can vary so widely from another. This is a notable problem in our city. In fact, a study by the New York State Health Foundation found that in the downstate region of the state, the highest priced hospitals are 2.2 to 2.7 times more expensive than the lowest priced hospitals. This discrepancy was higher than hospital cost discrepancies in western and central New York. Cost discrepancies among hospitals are problematic because it leaves ordinary New Yorkers unable to fully compare products like they would in any other business transaction. Everyday New Yorkers are left with the sole recommendations of a doctor that while they may be trusted, does not often have any information about potential costs to the consumer. <laughs> this can easily put any one of our neighbors or friends in financial peril. For decades, though, hospitals and insurance companies have gone back and forth blaming the other for this crisis. But in reality, both sides owe some responsibility for the differences in cost, and the only way they're going to change things is if they own up to that reality and work together to solve these challenges. But we can't wait around forever, and the disparities in our system are an urgent topic. Today our hearing aims to highlight a critical issue and to also underline why Albany must finally pass the New York Health Act which would provide comprehensive, universal health coverage for every New Yorker and allow the state to negotiate fair deals with hospitals for procedure costs. We in the council are prepared to do our part, whether it is lobbying in Albany or holding a hearing and subsequently passing a resolution in support of the New York Health Act, which we will be doing next month. In the meantime, I look forward to hearing more about the process hospitals go through to decide their prices and I hope we can get some clarity. This is an issue that affects New Yorker, every New Yorker, especially those who cannot afford to pay a single dollar more for health care costs, such as older adults, those living with disabilities, and those with limited incomes. As we approach a legislative session in Albany with the largest Democratic majority in a generation, I look forward to how our discussions here and at future hearings can inform our state <laughs> colleagues in the pursuit of progressive legislation to address our health and hospital systems. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Chair Rivera. And we've been joined by fellow committee members Alan Maisel, Francisco Moya. And we're going to kick it off to our first panel. Uh, Vice President Bragg, would that be you leading us off? To. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. So good morning. Um, Chairs Levine and Rivera and uh, our esteemed uh, committee members. My name is Kyle Bragg. I'm Secretary Treasurer of uh, SEIU 32BJ. Uh, as you know, 32BJ SEIU represents over 90,000 hardworking New Yorkers. We take real pride in the quality of health care benefits that we have won for our members. These benefits include premium free family coverage, low co pays, and a network of thousands of doctors that have real life changing impact in the quality of life of our members. Unfortunately, these benefits are jeopardized by the skyrocketing New York hospital costs. Our health fund has analyzed this data and found real differences in what they pay for the same care at different hospitals. The significant disparity in prices for the same care at different hospitals lacks rational justification. I can't understand why health fund has to pay an average of 83000 for a hip replacement at New York Presbyterian but an average of 58000 at other hospitals. Millions of dollars are being lost when hospitals are, can overcharge us for care. We need to find a solution. These higher prices are hurting our members. Every dollar that goes to benefits is a dollar that doesn't go into our members' wage increases. But this problem also has implications for hundreds of thousands of New Yorkers who participate in self-insured plans. It comes in the context of Presbyterian, 
threatening to leave a network that ensures nearly 3 million New Yorkers. Planned care for 32BJ members and others at Presbyterians could, uh, would uh, become prohibitively expensive because of high charges. Until we start talking to our members, uh, until we started talking to our members and the public about this issue, no one knew that there was such a variation in what we have to pay to hospitals. Hospitals demand that their contracts and rates be kept secret. This is crazy. What kind of market-based healthcare system do we have when you can't compare what you are buying before making such an important decision? We know there is a problem, and we are calling on elected officials in New York to find solutions to this problem. I want to thank the council for holding this important hearing and helping to bring transparency to the health care market. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll, I'll let you all determine uh, your speaking order unless, Sarah, you want to go next. Thank you. Good afternoon, uh, Chair People Rivera and Levine and council members. I'm Sarah Rothstein. I'm the director of the 32BJ Health Fund, a multi-employer plan that provides benefits to union members of SEIU 32BJ and their eligible dependents. Our plan participants have health insurance premiums that are fully funded by employers that negotiate with the union. The fund is jointly governed by a board of trustees appointed by the union and employers. We provide benefits to 200,000 people across 11 states, and most are here in the New York City metro area. Our fund is self-insured. This means that the fund, not an insurer, pays all the bills for medical claims incurred by our members. We design the benefits in terms of what's covered. We use a third-party administrator, and in our case, that's Empire Blue Cross Blue Shield to provide a network and to process claims. But we pay them a flat administrative fee. They aren't paid more if our members use more or less services or if we pay higher dollar amounts for care. Empire negotiates rates with providers such as hospitals, doctors, labs, but we pay all the bills for those services and we aren't privy to how those contracts are negotiated. Contracts are confidential and we don't know what the terms are. We get claims data and we're fortunate to have a team of analysts who analyze the data so we know where people go for care and what we pay each time they use benefits. After an analysis of our claims data, in which we looked at several common inpatient and outpatient services, we determined that for several types of care, on average, we pay more at New York Presbyterian and its affiliated hospitals than for the same care at other hospitals. The hospitals in the New York Presbyterian health system include Columbia University Medical Center, Weill Cornell, New York Presbyterian Queens, Brooklyn Methodist, Lower Manhattan Hospital, and several others in the region. Examples of care in which we, on average, pay more at New York Presbyterian than the average for comparable care at other New York City hospitals include the following. On average, we paid New York Presbyterian $82,843 for hip replacements. That's $25,000 more than we paid, on average, for the same procedure at other New York City hospitals. For bariatric surgery, we paid on average $56,858 at New York Presbyterian. That's $11,000 more than we paid on average for the same procedure at other hospitals. For childbirth, for vaginal deliveries, we paid an average of $23,635 at New York Presbyterian, nearly $7,000 more than we paid on average for the same procedure at other hospitals. For cataract surgery, we paid on average $10,929 at New York Presbyterian. That's more than $6,000 more than we paid on average for the same procedure at other hospitals. And for colonoscopies, on average, we paid New York Presbyterian $8,151. That's $5,000 more than we paid on average for the same procedure at other New York City hospitals. In our analysis, we selected procedures where there is minimal clinical variation in how the care is performed. This minimized the need to risk adjust, meaning to adjust the numbers if one population is sicker or healthier than the others. But we nevertheless took several steps to risk, several steps to risk adjust our findings. The price discrepancies remained even after that risk adjustment. These significant cost differences are important because every time the fund or any other health plan pays more for care than it has to, it undermines the long-term stability of our health plans and ability to provide meaningful health coverage to our members. Thank you. Okay. 
Okay, my name is Edward Kaplan. I represent the Siegel Company. Thank you, council members, uh, for uh, committee members for the opportunity to speak to you. The Siegel Company has been around for 75 years in New York. We provide benefits consulting and actuarial consulting services to employers, taft Hartley funds around New York and around the country. I've been with the company 25 years, over 30 years in, in employee benefits consulting. As Sarah said, most large plant sponsors and even mid-sized employers are self-funded, self-insured. Over 92% of our clients are self-insured, meaning they bear the risk of the cost of claims, whether the hospital, prescription drug, physician services. So uh, whatever they can do, we can do to save, save them money, goes right to their bottom line in terms of their self-insured benefits, which frees up money for wages, pensions, and so forth. Our primary goal is to provide strategy, auditing, design, procurement assistance to large clients and mid-sized clients like 32BJ, although they're one of the larger ones. Inpatient and outpatient claims is the number one expense that plant sponsors pay. It's about 35 to 40 percent of all benefit dollars go to hospital, inpatient, and outpatient services. So it's the biggest item, slice of the pizza pie, if you will, that is in most typical employers. Siegel has a health data analytics department. Actuaries and data scientists look at data and we sign non-disclosure agreements to get individual hospital data from the big carriers and we can only disclose information. We do get price information on individual hospitals, but we can only use that data for that particular client. We can't even talk about it publicly, which we'd like to do. Um, and when we look at that data, we find great variations in, in hospital pricing in the New York metro uh, area, downstate area. The top hospitals are charging a little bit more than two times the average of all the other hospitals for the same procedures. When we look at common procedures with any statistical difference in quality that we can determine. Um, so there is that huge variation. If our clients knew that, that would help them make informed decisions on how to negotiate, how to select network hospitals, how to exclude network hospitals. So it's a very important element to, to be able to get individual hospital pricing. There's a very complex process to look at DRGs and risk, chart, risk, risk scores to kind of adjust to give hospitals their fair analysis to make sure we're accounting for sicker patients by hospital, things of that nature, to normalize the cost so we are making a fair assessment. But that's, that cost are getting, those, those, uh, those adjustment factors are very complex and harder and more costly to, for us to do, to do those analyses for our clients. And with the last couple of points here is we are aware of the, of the, of the anti-competitive contract agreements between the hospitals and the, and the health insurers. Uh, we are a proponent to get rid of those anti-competitive, anti-steering contracts, most favored nation clauses. Many of our clients want to customize and go directly to hospital X or hospital Y. And the, many of those contracts prohibit my clients from going and negotiating directly or else they're going to jeopardize the rest of their network contracts. So there's a lot of anti-competitive barriers that we have to get over to help our clients uh, save money for their membership. So basically, just want to conclude that we do agree and support anything you can do in your efforts to, to uh, remove and prohibit anti-competitive contracts and to improve the transparency of hospital pricing, just like we are pushing for drug pricing as well. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, my name is uh, Miguel Santos. I'm a 32BJ member. I work at the commercial office cleaner at Midtown. Uh, I work closely with the union uh, to make sure that our victories lead to fair wages and benefits. Uh, health care in uh, healthcare insurance is so important to our members, and that is why we keep fighting to, co to keep costs down while keeping the quality and care high. I'm here today because I'm really worried about our health care. Our benefits are at risk because of the cost of care at New York Presbyterian is way too high. Uh, we all work together to keep costs down, and that is why I think New York Presbyterian should have fair prices for care. I learned from the health fund that uh, an outpatient procedure like an MRI cost on average is $997 at other New York hospitals. Uh, at Presbyterian, it costs $2,419 for a procedure that is exactly the same way. Uh, if, healthcare, if healthcare gets too expensive, then winning strong contracts with wage increase will be an arduous task. Um, I would like to thank New York City Council for its leadership. We need transparency, fairness, and healthcare costs. I ask that a hospital like New York Presbyterian treat union members and NYC residents fairly. We need fairness and honesty from our healthcare providers. Thank you. Hi, 
My name is Rich Iorio. I'm a member of 32BJ. I work on East River Houses on 530 Grand Street. My union 32BJ works hard for all of its members so that we can win strong contracts with real benefits. Our families rely on the health care coverage and my good union job. Our benefits are at risk because of the increased cost of hospital care. The staff at 32BJ Health Fund work hard to keep our care affordable. That is why I don't understand why care at New York Presbyterian is so expensive. I heard that one year our fund paid $10,929 to Presbyterian for a cataract surgery, while at other providers the cost of the same surgery is $4,252. As a union member, I want to know why it's so expensive. Since those costs affect thousands of our members, the more we have to pay for benefits, the less there is for our wages. Working families in this city need every dollar. We can't have healthcare institutions overcharging us while trying to make our ends meet. I want to thank the council for holding this hearing. Uh, this hearing, you are helping the union households. I call on New York Presbyterian to do the right thing for millions of New Yorkers and work to get the costs under control immediately. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to all of you. Just want to understand. You don't have access to pricing at the hospitals where your patients, where your members are receiving care in any kind of direct way. You've been able to essentially reverse engineer by looking at billing records and um, therefore compare amongst healthcare providers. Is that right? And, and that's how you've discovered discrepancies amongst uh, a wide array of providers. Is that accurate? That's correct. So when hospitals and insurance companies negotiate rates and negotiate those contracts, those contracts and rates are confidential. We don't have the ability to know ahead of time how much care will cost at different facilities. A member of ours will go get care. A few months later, we'll get a claim. We take the claims for 200,000 people over years of time, and then we analyze that data to figure out what we had to pay for care at different hospitals, and then we look at the differences in what we had to pay at each and, hospital. And so you, you contract with an insurance company, in, in your case it was Empire, and if, if when you contract with them, if you were to say, well, we, we'd love to hire you, but only if you give us transparency on pricing, what would they say to you? They would tell us they aren't permitted, that the hospitals don't permit them to share the negotiated rates. Understood. Um, you talked about this anti-competitive clause. Uh, it, it, that, that means that um, the hospitals are prohibiting uh, you who are paying the bills from uh, essentially shopping around for the best rates. Is, is that accurate? How does that clause work? We think there's a few things happening. One is that there's no public disclosure of the rates that hospitals have demanded from the insurance companies. So we, as a client of third-party administrators, would appreciate having the opportunity to look at all the rates negotiated in the market and find the best package of rates from third-party administrator that we could get. We don't have the ability to do that. The only way we could do that is have a one year with one third-party administrator, switch to a different one another year, a different another year in order to collect the claims data to do the analysis that um, is not an inefficient or transparent market. Um, the other thing that may be happening, as was reported in the Wall Street Journal uh, about a month ago, is that some hospitals, and it named New York Presbyterian, have language in their contracts that prohibit third-party administrators um, and insurers from offering flexible or narrow or other types of innovative networks to clients such as ours. Um, I would imagine that, that the more expensive hospitals would say, well, we're, we're spending more to provide a better patient experience, and that's why patients want to come to us. Um, it, do, do you think that's accurate? And, and if so, uh, do, you, do you charge higher deductibles uh, for the more expensive providers? Or is that even, that maybe not even allowed? I think hospitals probably don't like that, but is that not allowed under your contract? I'll answer the first part first and then the second part. Um, in terms of quality, we've looked at our claims data and we don't see the quality of care being at New York Presbyterian being any different than the quality of care at other hospitals in the 
kinds of care we've looked at. The quality is neither better nor worse. We have asked our third party administrator, as well as other third party administrators in the markets, if we can have flexible networks or if we could have other kinds of network structures, and the answer has been no. Got it. So the, 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 this, this, uh, this, t this tier and steer uh, model, can you explain what, what does that mean and how would that work potentially? So you, our, and, do I have the term correct? Sure. So our understanding uh, from the Wall Street Journal and from other sources is that some hospitals, such as New York Presbyterian, prohibit third-party administrators from offering tiered networks or narrow networks to their clients. Either could be used to provide more cost-effective benefits to members in a narrow network. Some hospitals, such as the highest cost hospitals, could be excluded. In a tiered network, members may have access to all hospitals, but might have to pay more to access some of the most expensive hospitals. Uh, you, you, as we mentioned, you have uh, pieced this together on your own with no help from either the insurer or the hospital. Have any of the parties disputed your numbers, either any of the hospitals or the insurance provider? No, New York Presbyterian has neither asked about our data nor disputed it. All right. that's. Uh, Important to hear. I want to acknowledge we've been joined by fellow committee member, council member Alika Ampri Samuel. Welcome. And I'm going to pass it off to co chair Carlina Rivera. Thank you so much. So, you, um, Chair Levine just mentioned a little bit about the reverse engineering, but typically, how are patients or some of your members, I guess, since that's who you have the experience with, how are they informed about hospital costs? So, for the time being, uh, they haven't been. We started doing research on our data, analysis on our data, and we've started sharing the data with our members because we were surprised at how big the price differences are for care at different hospitals. And as we've been sharing the data with them, they've been surprised as well. We think it's been valuable to share this information with them and with the public. So what happens if, if someone with private insurance, they receive a bill for a service that was covered by their health plan, but they can't pay? So in our plan, one of the things we work really hard to do is to ensure that copays are low for covered services. And we have used plan design to incentivize our members to use lower cost sites of care. So for example, our members pay nothing for an x-ray in a freestanding radiology site. They'll pay nothing for outpatient surgery if they have it in an independent non-hospital owned facility. Our members do have to pay copays if they get hospital-based care, but the copays are low. I couldn't speak to what people would do in other plans where they have higher deductibles or higher copays, but I could imagine that some people who are in high deductible plans um, might have a hard time paying bills. So what do you think some of the reasons um, different hospitals would have different costs? I know you mentioned a little bit in your testimony, but. So rather than speculate, I would just like to share some information that was in the report from the New York State Health Foundation that you cited. Um, so they said that higher priced hospitals may be higher priced as a result of various forms of market leverage, which gives them more bargaining power to command higher prices with negotiating with insurers. Hospitals that have a greater market share are generally higher priced. Hospitals that are part of a hospital system with a large regional market share are generally higher priced regardless of their own size or individual market share. So why do you believe the discrepancies exist? So I have information that's in the New York State Health Foundation report. There are a number of health economists who have also looked at price discrepancies within markets. Their theory, uh, which they have looked at the data and they think the data supports, um, is that having a significant market share enables hospitals to demand higher prices. So you mentioned a number of procedures. You mentioned a hip replacement and cataracts and colonoscopies in terms of the disparities. How, how much time have you, I guess, how many procedures more or less do you think you have in terms of pricing? And how long did it take you to compile all of that data? We're fortunate because we have a fund of our size. We're able to have a team of data analysts. It was small. It's now bigger. Um, 
I would say it takes some time for people to get trained up on how to look at this kind of data. Um, but once you start doing it, it's actually not that complicated um, and fairly, fairly straightforward. And we're certainly happy to share the details of our analysis if anyone wants. We documented our methods very carefully. But we have data on additional episodes. We selected the episodes we did because they're amongst the most common. So maternity care, for example, is a third of planned hospital admissions for our members. Joint replacement, bariatric surgery, also common procedures for our members. Colonoscopies, we pay for over 5,000 of them a year. So we selected amongst the procedures that represent a large share of our claims. I mean, the reason why I say that is because, I mean, we would, I, I, and I know that Levine um, and I, we have the same beliefs about transparency, and, and that goes with voluntary and public hospitals in terms of the data that's provided. I mean, I would love, and, and again, this is something that we're going to hope to lobby Albany over, is some sort of annual report that lists hospital charges for items and services. I think that would be the most transparent way for our systems to operate. But in the meantime, you've done your own due diligence and taking care of your members, and, and I'd be really um, interested in, in maybe sitting down in the future and going over over what you've compiled and what you've seen specifically at this institution. I appreciate that opportunity. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I believe Councilmember Powers has a question. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for doing this hearing. And thank you for all the testimony. Um, could you just define the group of people that are affected by this? Is it is it what is it your labor union specifically? Is this all New Yorkers that are under different plans? Is it those? Is it Empire? Who is the affected group of people that we're discussing? So the data points I referenced are for medical services used by our members, so union members of SEIU 32BJ and their eligible dependents. But that said, while contracts between insurers and hospitals are confidential. I would imagine that other self-insured health plans, including New York City, would face some same some of the same pressures. Got it. Uh, and, and is your is your price discrepancy in relation to your agreement with Empire then? Because Empire is your administrator, and then they have an agreement with New York Presbyterian. Is that how this works? So, and if so, is that does that mean others who have arrangements or uh, are covered by Empire also experience the same? Uh, the same just price discrepancies. My best guess is that other people who self-insure through Empire would face the same price discrepancies. Yeah. I can also say that a few years ago, we briefly used Cigna as our third-party administrator. We took a look to see if the data held during that, if the same patterns held during that period of time as well, and they did. I could just build on that. You know, Siegel has done analyses for a lot of uh, building trade unions and employers, and it's the same pattern. Uh, that we see it in, 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 in all those plant sponsors. Got it. And have you guys sought any sort of like, I mean, you're doing your own data collection here to help make the case. Have you done any, sought any sort of third party validation to make sure? I mean, I, I'm not sure if we're going to hear, uh, you know, you, you, you said that you have not yet um, heard a dispute, I guess, from Presbyterian, meaning that potentially it's, it's a valid claim and they're not disputing it. But I'm just wondering if there's been an attempt to collect information in another formal way as well to look at how others are affected, the public's perfect, you know, but also to validate the claims that you guys are, uh, not the claims, but validate the, the, the price discrepancies. Sure. We're more than happy to share our methodology. Um, and discuss it. We feel confident that we've taken all the steps necessary to produce a valid methodology. Got that. And then I was, I was, has Office of Labor Relations or any other city agency been uh, involved in this conversation? As they, uh, not all your members are, are, you know, here are are public employees. But I'm just wondering if, as the city agency that oversees contracts and healthcare negotiating, if they've been brought into this conversation at all. So my understanding is that the Municipal Labor Committee and their health experts in the Municipal Labor Community uh, have been looking at what their costs are with different health systems. The MLC, in a letter jointly signed by Bob Lynn and I believe Harry Nespoli, sent a letter to New York Presbyterian saying it was the most expensive hospital according to their claims. Gotcha. Thank you. And and about the market share, is, is, is there was discussion about a higher market share resulting in higher prices, um, and the is the price at, is Presbyterian the highest? Do they have the heart lies the largest market share? In New York City, they're one of the largest. One of the largest. Okay, great. Uh, okay, thank you. Thanks for answering questions.
Thank you very much, Councilmember Powers. And I believe Councilmember Jane also has a question. Yep. Uh, thank you for this information. I know it takes a lot of time and effort to compile this, considering the lack of transparency that exists, both in the insurance side, um, through obligation and through the hospital side. I do want to say, since you have the information, have you been able to use it to negotiate with Empire, for example, um, and maybe say we don't want to have or encouraging your uh, union members to not go to Presbyterian um, and in doing so, saving them money and then figuring out a way to give that back to the workers um, if, if there's a, or letting Empire know that the, you don't want Presbyterian to be one of the hospitals that are under your plan um, and that maybe that builds some leverage and allows you to have more conversations, at least more transparency. Yeah, all good ideas. In the best of all possible scenarios, New York Presbyterian would cut its prices by 30%. That's what we think it would take to be competitive or on par with the rest of the market. Empire is certainly understands our position. They and New York Presbyterian have to negotiate a contract, and it's really up to them to agree on a contract. So you're, you're not allowed to dictate whether or not you even want Presbyterian to be in your coverage? So if we use a third party administrator, we can only use the networks that they offer to us. Right now, neither they nor any of the other large carriers are able to offer us a network that excludes New York Presbyterian. I see. So I'm just thinking here, there's a lot of you, a lot of 32BJ members. And if you're talking about Harry, that's some Teamsters. It's a lot of folks that are under these, these contracts um, for healthcare. Uh, maybe there is something that can be done through enough with enough pressure. It's just uh, you're you're stuck in a pickle that you can't get out of if there's no one that's willing to be flexible with exactly where you get your coverage. Because I could imagine if you can dictate that that you would be able to save a lot of money for your members, um, and that would be the ultimate goal: same coverage, uh, less money. Uh, I could see that happening. So this is very eye-opening to to be at this hearing and really hear this. Uh, and of course, anything that I can do or we can do in this council to be helpful, we're going to do. But I'm um, very interesting how you've been, you're stuck between a rock and a hard place. Uh, but thank you for putting in the effort and getting that information out so that we can start using it and try to build policy that can be helpful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilman Reynoso. Uh, it seems like the insurance companies are so, um, such a barrier to uh, transparency and, and freer negotiations. Could you not just cut them out and and run this yourself and negotiate directly with hospitals? Could maybe many employers come together to do that citywide and just remove that middle layer that's such a barrier? It's certainly something we're exploring. Okay. Is, is the, does the data indicate patterns on the types of procedures that, um, that are are disproportionately overcharged at some hospitals, or is it just haphazard because of the, all the, um, the strange uh, variables that go into the pricing? We don't see any clear patterns on the types of care. Council Member Rivera? Right. So I wanted to follow up on the insurance part because we received some testimony um, from, from GNYHA and they mentioned that each insurance company has different rules that govern their negotiations with hospitals. And so I'm wondering what, what role do health insurance companies play in determining health care costs? Uh, given, again, that the contracts are confidential, I'm not privy to what rules they're referring to, but I could also imagine that hospitals might have their own set of rules on how they negotiate. And I hope with, um, as Reynoso mentioned, going forward, we can all work collaboratively to, to, to figure this out. So I just want to thank you again for your testimony, for all of you, and for taking time off to testify today. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair, and um, thank you to this panel. We very much appreciate you sharing your insight today on this important topic. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, for, for our next uh, testimony, we're going to call David Rich from the Greater New York Hospital Association.
Welcome, Mr. Rich. Thank you. And please take it away. Thank you. Great. My name is David Rich with the Greater New York Hospital Association. Our members include all of the hospitals in New York City, both public and voluntary, as well as hospitals throughout the region. Hospital pricing is an extremely complex topic. Hospitals cover the cost of delivering 24-7 patient care and the other benefits they provide for their communities through a patchwork quilt of set payments from government payers like Medicare and Medicaid and negotiated rates with private insurance companies. Each insurance company has different rules that govern their negotiations with hospitals, and some of those rules are set nationally at corporate headquarters in other states like Indiana, Minnesota, or Connecticut. No two negotiations are the same, and prices differ from insurer to insurer, even for patients utilizing the same hospital. Negotiated rates for one hospital may even differ for enrollees of the same insurance company, but who are enrolled in different insurance products offered by the company, for example, a preferred provider organization plan versus an HMO. It is up to the insurance company to make sure that their enrollees and our patients understand what their plan covers, what their out-of-pocket costs may be based on the rates they have negotiated with hospitals and other providers too, uh, doctors, pharmaceutical companies, etc. Only insurance companies know what their enrollees' required copays and deductibles are. That is why Governor Cuomo has directed the State Department of Financial Services to require insurance companies to provide members with information and cost estimator tools. Only the insurers know this information about the many providers a patient may interact with. The New York City hospital marketplace is highly congested and extremely competitive. In New York City, we have six major hospital systems and a number of other hospitals as well. All are competing for patients. This has the benefit of providing many choices for consumers, but it also means that insurers have the luxury of designing narrow networks that may include some hospitals but exclude others. The ability of insurers to play hospitals and systems off each other has an effect on negotiated rates. It's important to note there's a huge mismatch between the size and scope of many of the insurers hospitals must negotiate with and the hospitals themselves. Our nonprofit hospitals are negotiating with huge national publicly traded insurance companies such as Anthem, which is known here as Empire, United Healthcare, and Aetna. These companies have major resources and unlike our hospitals must maximize profits to answer to their shareholders. They're hugely profitable and their profits have been soaring. United Healthcare reported profits of over $3 billion in the third quarter of 2018 alone. Anthem, Empire's parent, reported nearly a billion dollars in profits in the third quarter, and so did Aetna. These third quarter profits are larger than the entire annual budgets of most of our hospitals. Our hospital's resources are a drop in the bucket compared to the resources of these for-profit companies. These huge corporations have maximum incentive to pay the lowest possible prices to hospitals so they can provide a return to their investors. They drive very hard bargains and then engage in practices such as payment denials for medically necessary services to avoid or postpone payments to hospitals as long as possible. These attempts to slash hospital prices only add to these huge profits. Is that what we really want? I'm hoping that in the future we'll have a hearing to determine the impact of these companies' strong profit motives on the cost of health care premiums, and you could throw in the pharmaceutical companies while you're at it. While these behemoths nickel and dime our hospitals to death, by contrast, hospitals provide care to all New Yorkers of all income groups. They're there for all of us in emergency situations, no questions asked. Unlike in other states where most hospitals are not Medicaid providers, all of our hospitals provide high quality medical care for Medicaid patients. The great healthcare infrastructure our hospitals have created benefits all New Yorkers. Very briefly, because this is in my written testimony, other factors that can cause variability in hospital prices include the relative need to make up for Medicare and Medicaid underpayments, whether or not a hospital is an academic medical center, a teaching hospital, or a non-teaching hospital, a hospital's reputation for quality care and qualitative differences, which may influence whether an insurer feels the need to have a hospital in its network. So in closing, there are many reasons that rates hospitals have negotiated with insurers can differ from hospital to hospital and from insurer to insurer. What is clear is the old adage, you get what you pay for. If hospitals cannot cover their costs and the losses they incur from caring for Medicare and Medicaid patients, they not only cannot provide community benefits, invest in technologies, expert professional staff, and provide good wages and benefits for their unionized workforces, but they cannot survive at all. Therefore, we call upon the City Council to support their local hospitals, as we know you do, and I'm more than happy to answer any questions that you have. 
Thank you, Mr. Rich. You talk about a competitive landscape for hospitals today, but there's certainly less competition today than there was 20 years ago or even five years ago. The pace of consolidation has been dramatic and it's continuing. It seems like basic economics is when a smaller number of players in a marketplace take on a bigger and bigger market share, they start to gain the ability to push prices up. Is that not what's happening? You know, I think anyone looking at uh, the different marketplaces in the country and looks at the relative um, competitiveness of them, ours is one of the most competitive. You know, as I mentioned, if you don't want to go to Mount Sinai, you can go to NYU. If you don't want to go to NYU, you can go to New York Presbyterian. If you don't want to go there, you can go to H&H or one of the other hospitals. Um, we also have some major specialty hospitals like Hospital for Special Surgery, Memorial Sloan Kettering. So there's a lot of competition there. It is true, obviously, that a lot of the hospitals have taken on smaller hospitals. Some of that has been at the request of the state because a lot of the other smaller hospitals were in financial difficulty. I think we discussed this a lot at the last hearing that I testified at. But I really don't think, there was an article the other day in the New York Times about um, competitive marketplaces for hospitals, and there weren't any New York examples. They mentioned a no variety of other states, um, but they didn't mention New York. Partly also because we don't have huge for-profit hospital chains. We're not allowed to have for-profit hospitals in the state of New York. We're the only state where that's true. Elsewhere in the country, most states have um, hospitals that are part of multi-state chains, which we do not have here in New York. Right, I'll just point out the comparisons to other cities are they're often smaller markets where you may just have one major player or Correct. two. And so, Correct, um, uh, you, you don't have to have that near monopoly status to uh, begin to exert influence on, on pricing. The other component of, of, of of, of competitive marketplaces, transparency, so that whoever's paying for your services can compare, can comparison shop, essentially. It doesn't seem like we have any transparency at all. It seems like it's very hard for the people who are determining where to shop, if that's the right term. They can't tell where they're getting charged uh, for any given procedure. Um, how can you have competition in pricing without any sort of transparency? So two um, points to make on that. Starting on January 1st, uh, the federal government is requiring all hospitals to have on their internet their charges, which is basically like their list price, if you will. Um, they, for years, have been required to provide it upon request. Now it will have to actually be on the internet. The issue with that, though, is that that's kind of like the list price, it's kind of like when you go to a hotel and you see on the back of the door, you know, oh, it's $1,000 for this room, but you're paying like two fifty. dollars <laughs> That's not the price that most people pay, and it's not the price that insurers pay because they've negotiated down from there on behalf of their enrollees. So that's why Governor Cuomo and others and others at the federal level have said, it really needs to be, and, and hospitals absolutely need to let people know what their prices are, but it's really the insurer who knows what product someone's enrolled in, what services that covers, what prices they've negotiated for each of those different products, because sometimes they negotiate different prices for those products. The hospitals don't know a person's copay or deductible um, or what their other out-of-pocket costs would, should be. And that's why Governor Cuomo has said the insurance companies should have cost estimator tools on their websites so that somebody could go to their website. It's something that a 32BJ member could do if Empire had it, go to their website and say, okay, I wanna go here versus here, what would that mean? And, and by the way, the hospitals would only know their price. They wouldn't know physician group prices. They wouldn't know if someone needs home health care afterwards, what that price is. They really only know their particular price um, and whatever they've negotiated. I should also say it sounded like everyone thinks hospitals demand all of these contract provisions. From our perspective, it's the payers that want the confidentiality. They don't want... Mount Sinai to know the rate they've negotiated with NYU versus New York Presbyterian versus H and H, because if they, then if the hospital finds they negotiated a better price for one of these others, they'll demand it the next time they have contract negotiations, and that's why those confidentiality. Well, it seems like you have at least one pair who testified today who would rather have more transparency. Um, I think most people understand that uh, a university medical center might be more expensive than a 
community hospital or a public hospital. But assuming you don't dispute the data that we've heard already today, how do you explain great disparities in pricing between and amongst university hospitals right here in New York City? You know, I can't really explain it because I don't know the data myself. And I'm not really here to speak to one specific situation because I'm not, that's not my, I don't, um, it's not my purview. But I do think that, um, and I mentioned in my testimony a variety of reasons that there could be disparities. Um, I should point out that the rates that are being paid are rates Empire agreed to in whatever their last contract was. And we've seen Empire do this in a number of cases around the state where they have a contract negotiation coming up. And I'm, and this is not in the case of 32BJ because they did the they ran the data themselves. But they've also often put out data. They did this with Westchester Medical Center a few years ago. They did it with the Nassau Hospital um, earlier this year. Data that nobody can quite replicate. And again, I'm not saying that's true in this case. Um, to try to get people on their side in a contract negotiation. Um, we've seen it not just with Empire and Anthem, but we've seen it with United Healthcare, Aetna, all the different players. So, you know, why would, if, should the data be true? And I, again, I can't comment on that, and I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with it. I think the person to ask would be Empire. Those are rates they negotiated, to, they negotiated and signed on the bottom line to. So it seems to me they're the ones to ask why they pay the rates that they do. Okay, thank you. Chair Rivera? Yes, thank you so much for being here. Mm -hmm. um, so we're, we're, just, we're really just trying to figure out how a lot of these um, charges are determined and cost and how you know, New Yorkers can just better prepare and know and know what tools are available. Because even the calculator that you mentioned, you said in, in, in kind of your remarks that even that would it's flawed because you're not quite sure kind of pre and post whatever it is that you need, what your individual family um, necessity is. So ch it, charges are, are different from cost, but, but they are presumably correlated. So why would one hospital have much higher charges than, than others? You know, they all set their charges themselves and the federal government then requires that and requires them to have a set number of charges. They do that because some, sometimes the federal government through Medicare, the state government through Medicaid, uh, has reimbursement rates that are based on cost, and so they have these complicated calculations to determine what the difference between, you know, what is the markup? And I think that's a little bit of what you're asking. I do not know why one hospital would have, you know, uh, major higher charges than another, other than the examples I gave in my testimony. So an academic medical center that is a huge teaching center that gets sicker patients than community hospitals, because when you need, you know, as you know, if you go to a community hospital, but you have a very serious condition, you might get transferred to an academic medical center. So their cohort of patients tend to be sicker at an academic medical center or a major teaching hospital than others. So those are some of the reasons. Um, and you know, just some of the infrastructure that they have to have in order to make sure that you know, their medical students are learning everything they need and seeing everything that they need to see. Their residents are being trained on the latest technology. Um, they also compete with you know, hospitals across the country outside of New York. Um, so there could be a lot of reasons why their charges are higher than others, but I can't give any specific example of why Hospital A might have higher charges than Hospital B. You mentioned reputation as one of the reasons. You said that that has an impact on contract negotiations. Can you talk a little bit about what you mean by reputation? Sure. I think if you were an employer and you were pro providing health insurance for your employees, um, you would want to know from them which providers you'd want to make sure were going to be available to them which hospitals, which doctor groups, et cetera. And so, you know, consumers have strong opinions about where they want to go. Um, they also have strong opinions about um, their physicians and where their physicians have admitting privileges. So you were asking about steering and tiering before. You know, one of the, and that's basically meaning, as you know, that um, you sort of put providers in different tiers based on cost, hopefully based on quality as well, but um, we've seen it more across the country based on cost. 
And then if your enrollee goes to tier one, they pay lower premiums and co-pays and deductibles. If they go to tier two, they pay more. Tier three, they pay even more. So one of the issues there I would think consumers would have is if they have, let's say, you've been a longtime patient of a doctor that admits to Mount Sinai, and suddenly the insurance company puts them in tier two or three. You as a consumer might suddenly have higher costs than you had before because now they're trying to steer you to a different provider, not the one you've been going to for years, that your doctor has admitting privileges at, and that could be a real issue for consumers, I would think. And just something I, I asked the panel before you on how are patients informed about hospital costs? Do you feel like the, the members in your association are, are doing their best to be upfront about what consumers can expect? I think they are. I think there are improvements that can be made. And I did mention that starting in January, um, there's going to be the requirement that all of their charges be online. I think that some actually have been trying to do patient calculators as well on, of their own. Uh, what I mentioned before, though, that makes that difficult is that they can't always know when a patient calls and says, because so many of us, we know we have Empire, or we have United Healthcare, or we might have another plan, but we're not really that conversant in what that means or what it covers or you know, even how much of your deductible, if you have a high deductible, you've already spent during the year. And so it makes it very hard for a provider, a hospital, a physician group, another home care agency, or wherever it might be, to be able to say, this is exactly what you're going to have out of pocket. That's why I said it's really the insurer that has all of that information. They know what's covered. Um, as, the, um, as the person from 32BJ said, they, they decide what's covered in different plans that they offer, um, and it isn't really the hospital that would know that. Um, so I think, you know, the always improvements can be made, and I'm not at all saying it's only on insurers to help consumers understand. It's certainly an important hospital function as well, but they really do hold all the data. When someone's uninsured, that's when the hospital really needs to especially um, work with people to let them know what costs might be. And all of the hospitals have on their websites what their financial assistance plans are. They put on their, they're required to put on their bills under state law. You know, if you need help with your bill, we have a financial assistance policy and here's, um, here's what it is. State law um, on financial assistance policies says that um, you basically can't charge more for certain income levels than the Medicare rate or the Medicaid rate or, um, or you know, the most prevalent private insurance rate that you have. And then it also needs to be on a sliding scale. So when it comes to an uninsured people, that's how hospitals deal with um, the uninsured. Um, they're pretty much the only providers that take care of uninsured individuals, but um, that's how they deal with that with um, those patients who mainly come in in emergency situations, unfortunately. Thank you, Chair Rivera. The transparency for the uninsured is, is welcome. Nothing like that on the insured side at the moment. And is, uh, would you commit to work with us to bring more transparency to pricing for insured patients? Absolutely. And, and as I said, I think, uh, and I can provide with you and would be happy to, the American Hospital Association, working with the um, Health Finance Management Association, um, came up with a whole price transparency recommendation paper where they talked about how, uh, like I just said, when it's uninsured patients, that's where hospitals really have to sort of do the most work. When it comes to insured patients, it's really the insurers that have all of the information, including how much of your deductible you've already spent that year. That's not something a provider will know. Um, and so that's, you know, I would be happy to share that paper with you. I think it's a really excellent issue brief um, that can help inform, I think we might have shared it with some of your staff, that can help inform um, your discussions going forward. Um, you mentioned that there's no for-profit hospitals in New York. But we sure allow for-profit insurers, yes, and they are dominating more and more the market. But there are still nonprofit insurance providers in the city. 
are they a m more benevolent actors? And maybe we need to be steering more employers towards uh, those kind of nonprofits. Uh, they are. A lot of them, though, um, because, you know, em Empire used to be our big not-for-profit Blue Cross Blue Shield plan, and then it converted and got taken over by Anthem. Um, most of the not-for-profit insurers, in the city at least, tend to be Medicaid managed care plans uh, who may also provide Medicare Advantage products. A lot of them are provider-based. So for instance, Health First is one that we actually started for the Medicaid population and is, is um, owned by a number of our hospital members. And then Metro Plus, which you're very familiar with as well, is H&H's version of that. Um, and so that's what they tend to be. They tend to focus on um, low-income populations and government populations, and they're a little bit less in the commercial space, if you will. Um, the place where that varies some is a lot of them participate in the um, ACA, New York State of Health type plans, which are characterized as commercial plans. But again, those tend to be people up to a certain income level. Thank you very much, Mr. Rich. Thank you very much. And we're going to go to our next panel, which is Leslie Moran from the New York Health Plan Association, Gene Pender from Clear Health Costs, and Anthony Feliciano from the Commission on the Public's Health System. Okay, welcome. Would you like to kick us off? Um, certainly. My name is Leslie Moran. I'm the Senior Vice President at the New York Health Plan Association. We represent health plans across the state. Um, most of the, both the uh, commercial plans as well as the plans that are serving largely government-sponsored uh, enrollees. Um, I just wanted to make one comment following up on Mr. Rich's comments that health plans, all of the health plans in New York State are required by law, both under the Affordable Care Act and New York State law. Um, they are required to spend at least 82 cents of every dollar on health care. So that's just to his point that it's going to profits and not to health care. So it is going to health care. We appreciate the opportunity to share our views with you. Um, <clears throat> we are equally concerned about the rising cost of health insurance or health costs and the affordability of health coverage. It's the number one challenge that faces employers and consumers. And as health insurance premiums reflect the cost of care, the high prices that are charged by some providers exacerbates the challenge. Increases in the cost of hospital services, both inpatient and outpatient, is one of the largest factors that drives up health premium costs. I think you heard earlier that about 35% of, of cost of health care cost is directly attributable to the inpatient and outpatient services. Hospital costs are increasing even as utilization of services is going down. Um, data that came from the Healthcare Cost Institute shows that between 2012 and 2016, the prices for inpatient hospital services increased by 24.3%, while utilization for services actually decreased by 12.9%. New York has some of the highest healthcare costs, as uh, Chairperson Levine noted. Um, we have some of the highest in the country. They're markedly higher than the national average. Um, and as noted, the hospital costs are a main contributor to that statistic. Although the focus of today's hearing is New York Presbyterian, uh, we would urge, um, we think it's a mistake for the council just to look at this one facility because there are others as well that have extremely high prices and should be looked at as well. Um, the variation in hospital prices is driven by the market leverage of certain providers. As Chair Rivera noted, the New York State Health Foundation did a study looking at price variation. That study highlighted, market, the, highlighted a market dysfunction. Among the findings, the wide variation in provider prices is not based on quality, acuity, or complexity. It also said that higher priced institutions draw greater volume from lower priced institutions 
and a hospital's market leverage or its bargaining power when negotiating with insurers is a key factor in the prices that a hospital can command. The study found that price variation exists across, the, across New York State, but as Chair Rivera noted, it's greater in the downtown region or in the downstate region. It also found that hospitals command a larger, that hospitals that can command a larger market share are generally higher priced um, and hospital participation in a hospital system with significant regional commercial market share can influence higher hospital prices as well. We believe that addressing price variation should benefit employers and consumers. Any effort to address variation in provider prices should align with the following principles. Provider prices may vary for justifiable reasons, including quality of care, acuity, regional differences, and patient mix, but they should not vary due to size, geographic isolation, or market clout. Reducing variation in provider prices should result in a meaningful relief for consumers and employers by lowering health care costs. And reducing provider price variation should focus on rebalancing the current health care spending and not imposing new fees or assessments that will increase costs on employers and consumers. Approaches to address the price variation should include measures that prohibit anti-competitive provider contracting practices, which you heard about earlier. Those serve as a barrier to promoting greater competition in the marketplace. They should also focus on increased transparency of health care costs and more affordable options for employers and consumers. Again, thank you for the opportunity to offer our comments. Thank you for speaking. Thank you, <clears throat> thank, thank you for having us. <clears throat> My name is Jeannie Pinder. I'm the founder and CEO of clearhealthcosts.com. We're a journalism startup based here in New York City, bringing transparency to healthcare by telling people what stuff costs. Um, I come here as a journalist. <clears throat> I spent 25 years at the New York Times as a reporter, editor, and HR exec. I volunteered for a buyout and a year to the day later won a Shark Tank type pitch contest to build this company. <clears throat> Sorry, so how we do it, we use shoe leather journalism, crowdsourcing, data journalism, and investigative journalism to tell people what stuff costs in healthcare. We do this work not only on our home site, but also in partnership with other big news organizations. So how it's done, we have interactive software that has data in it. We collect data and then we encourage people to share their prices too. So this interactive software, you can think of it as something like a mashup between Kayak and the Waze traffic app, telling people what stuff costs in healthcare. By the way, we don't need legislation or regulation. We just went out and did it. Um, you might be surprised to know <clears throat> that a simple blood test could cost $19 one place or 522 a few blocks away. The same simple MRI could be $475 or $6,221, about 20 miles away. So what we do is, in displaying these prices, we give people real, oh, thank you, uh, agency, and we help them save, just by revealing prices as journalists. The, we also make great journalism out of it, so we don't just show the data, we make stories about how to avoid that facility fee how to figure out why your colonoscopy doesn't have to be $6,000, it can actually be 1,200, or how to get that blood test for $19 rather than 522. In New Orleans, we saved one woman $3,786 on a simple MRI. In San Francisco, uh, one man saved uh, $1,270 by putting away his insurance card and paying cash. A guy in Missoula used our data to save $2,010 by successfully challenging a bill. I could go on and on. We actually think that journalism is the solution. What if all the time and money spent on secrecy was erased from the system? What if we all knew prices in advance? What if we could actually call and get a straight answer about how to get that blood test for $19 rather than 522? What would happen if we searched for an MRI on Google and we got a bunch of price cards that drop down the way you get price cards that drop down when you search for an iPad? So that's what we're doing. Hey. Thank you very much, Anthony. Good afternoon, my name is Anthony Feliciano. I'm the director of the Commission on the Public Health System. 
let me first start by saying that disparities are also in the quality and the care. Where some New Yorkers are already well served, others are in desperate need of access and better care. Even though I would state that yet there's no direct correlation between cost and quality, it makes it even more complicated and the hospital charge widely different prices for similar care. For example, the state produces reports comparing costs for specific common diagnoses. The median cost of a patient discharge in 2014 after cesarean delivery with minor severity ranged from eight, a little bit over 18,000 reported by New York Presbyterian downtown to a little bit um, over 6,000 from Mount Sinai Roosevelt. It's super complicated to explain why care at one hospital appears to be nearly three times the cost of care at another, but we can say that now, it's not just only the bargaining power we're negotiating with insurers. We think it's also the different ways the two institutions or institute allocate and report cost. Um, sometimes interpreting the, the data varies in many ways. It can be attributed to many factors. Overall, overall volume, teaching hospital status, facility-specific attributes, geographic region, and care of, of quality of care provided. We will add also that it also has to do with the youth socioeconomic issues and problems most commonly framed as social determinants of health, the way uh, hospitals serve communities. And I would just state that, that there's also not transparency and also the uninsured, the way it's reported. So it's not just it's not accurate there how that was being stated earlier. Um, particularly, we know there's not public data for insurers and negotiated contracts. However, we think that perhaps when you look at a lot of the Higher cost housing doesn't seem means that they're giving higher quality care. Doesn't also mean if they're giving lower cost, that means that they're giving lower quality care as well. So we need to differentiate that as well. But also some of those same hospitals that are high highest cost also have many of them do have bad safety standards and well safety and safety ratings as well. So you have to look at that as as in one area. Some of them have a deal or worse on terms of safety. Um, you know that one time, I mean, inpatient care before the eighties uh, inpatient discharge or inpatient that was once a standard measure of hospital efficiency and utilization. Today, there's most outpatient studies that account for more than half of what the hospital share is. But one thing that widely can be used is is the ratio part. And so I'm going to just skip because I'm jumping around here. Let me think about the yardstick, the comparing costs that could be very important. I think the most meaningful and accurate method might be comparing the actual cost to care. For a, for a similar patient in a different hospital. That's, that's still very complicated, but that's one thing. Including, I think what we also should look at is, and I'm looking over here, that institutions, one of the other yardsticks comparing costs could be also is payroll costs per adjusted discharge. Uh, payroll expenses per adjusted discharge could be wages, benefits, and training, looking at all those categories. And most of that is required to the Institute of Cost Report, but I think that's another way of looking as a yardstick to look at cost, um, because the other variables may be very complicated. Let me just finally state that we really should address the disparity in cost, because it's also a disparity of the care. If you, there are, you know, New York State provided like 669 million in real property tax exemptions to private nonprofit healthcare providers. Some of those do not provide the proper care and have high cost. Mm. And so I think we need to look at disparities in many ways. And, and although it's not correlated around quality, there is issues there, um, including the high CEO salaries that we have with some of these for profit, um, for profit, private insurers. And someone mentioned about um, New York State, you know, in terms of only have not for profit hospitals, which is obviously true. But there's also a worry that they, in this thinking of cost, that maybe many times, and it's been in state legislation to go into for profit hospitals, allowing them to come here. I would think you would need to look at that very deeply because sometimes privatization doesn't ensure efficiency or any, any lower cost. Um, these are the key things. To me, it's really about the, uh, the community and about the workers. And the fact that we get tossed around between the insuring company and the hospitals is unfair and it's not just. Thank you. All right, thank you for that very important and powerful statement. Um, Ms. Moran, can you clarify, your members are all the health insurers in New York State, only the for-profit? No. Excuse me. We represent most of the health plans in New York State. There are just a, f a couple, um, one of them upstate, Excellus, we don't represent, uh, and a couple of plans downstate, but most of our plans, and we, we 
have for profit and not for profit, and there are, are actually I would think more not for profit plans in New York State than there are for profit plans. Okay, so we heard from uh, 32BJ from the employer side who wants more transparency. We heard from Greater New York Hospital Association; they want more transparency. We encourage transparency as well. So, how is it that if all three parties are calling for more transparency, we have incredibly opaque contracts. Well, it's largely because the the plans are not able to release their contract terms with the hospitals. I mean, the the it's we would like to see more transparency in terms of hospital costs, so that we be, can better understand the the disparities between different hospitals. Why the costs are so much higher at one hospital than another. Right, but you. You hold the most information. You know how much you're paying everybody for every kind of procedure. The, e even a group like 32BJ, which can kind of re reverse engineer it, doesn't know as much as you. But as Sarah pointed out, it's usually because we are not, the plans are not allowed to release those, that information from the hospitals don't want us to release the information. But you're saying you would like to. We're saying we, we think we should work collaboratively to increase transparency through across the system. Okay. Um, and and like one of them is, is through, you know, these cost estimators. All plans have cost estimators on their websites they're required to. Um, I think one of the things Mr. Rich pointed out was, you know, the, the different types of plans that are people that, that people are in and he talked about whether a person knew whether they had a you know, how much of their high deductible plan. He was really referring to um, when they're going to an out of network facility. I think what we're focused on here is when people are going in network, when they've done everything that they should be doing anyhow. Um, and so they're protected in terms of their costs if they go to an in network hospital. Okay. Seems like we need to get the hospitals and the insurance companies in a room since everyone separately is claiming they believe in transparency uh, so that no one can pass the buck on that. Um, Ms. Ms. Pender, based on your data analysis, do you concur with the analysis that 32BJ did about discrepancies in pricing? Uh, yeah, we see that kind of discrepancy everywhere. In fact, even bigger ones. We've seen <clears throat> a 20x delta in some places. Um, it's quite startling, really. And we do believe that the only answer is transparency. We'd be cheerful and happy to be an intermediary to help display that data. Because if anybody wanted to share data with us, be it individuals or institutions, we do have software that actually displays it in that sort of mashup of Kayak and Waze.com. Okay. Um, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. So um, uh, it's interesting that you mentioned kind of how your the site runs. And so I'm curious as to how you receive some of the feedback. For example, you mentioned something, uh, a person in New Orleans, a person mm -hmm. in Montana. Yeah. How did they reach out to you and let you know that your website helped them save money? Right. So our interactive software lets people contribute their pricing information on our site. So they can um, put their data in and be instantly represented in our database. Uh, we also get found a lot via uh, search engine optimization, SEO. Google loves us. So when people go and the guy in Missoula was trying to figure out what a CT scan should cost, so he typed into Dr. Google how much does a CT can scan cost, found us, and started explaining his um, sad saga. We helped him argue his bill and it saved him $2,010. Also, you should allow reviews then, like Yelp. We can, well, we let people chime in and tell us stuff. And then when we hear stories like that, we do blog posts. So the woman who saved the $3,786 came up to us. Actually, she's in a newsroom, and she came up to us and explained how she saved $3,786. So sometimes it's in-person feedback. We have a voicemail line. We let people call in and tell us things. So um, in our committee report, it's mentioned that, that larger hospital systems tend to have more bargaining power to reach cost agreements with insurance providers. Um, and we heard from Greater New York that, again, and, and I, I say this in trying to understand and determine why these discrepancies and these disparities exist, but you know, from what I heard from Greater New York, it really does lie with the insurance company as to how much they're charging. And we're not just picking on one hospital. We, we agree that across the board, 
these these disparities exist. So would you would you agree that with hospital consolidation that they do have more power to kind of ne negotiate what people are paying? Yes, I mean it's not just our thought, but there's data that shows that. I mean, both in the Health Foundation report, um, uh, while the New York Times article didn't look at any specific New York State or New York City hospital systems, certainly that New York Times story did point out that hospital consolidation has led to higher prices. That it's a national phenomenon. And one of the things, you know, we hear when we, we've, um, participated in some of the state health departments. Uh, it's the public health planning and uh, the public health and health planning council looks at when hospitals have consolidation um, applications in. Um, and we've been going to those to actually testify. Uh, and as I said, there is data across the country that shows that these consolidations have led to higher prices. And one of the arguments that is always used when the hospitals come and say, we need to consolidate because it will give us greater efficiency and that will in turn give us the ability to lower our costs. Um, but there's no kind of back end look at has that actually happened. So we have encouraged the state health department through the planning council to say, to come back and say, there needs to be a demonstration that you've actually recognize and realize these efficiencies and that you are lowering cost and passing that lower cost on to consumers. Um, unfortunately, that hasn't happened yet. No, I appreciate what you're saying. I mean, I think consolidation claims and being unverified is, is a pretty serious issue and goes kind of to the root of what we're discussing today. So, um, Mr. Feliciano, I have, I have a, I guess, a question. You are, uh, you work with a lot of advocates, community members, and you work with um, medical professionals. So how, with hospital consolidation and staying on this topic, how's, how has your work changed as a result of hospital consolidation and how have changes impacted the communities that you work with and serve? Oh, I can spend the whole session on this part, but uh, it's come down to a lot of the quality and the access to services and programs. Um, consolidation has been based on in New York State looking at a flaw uh, formula around overbetting as one of them. Um, there's obviously mismanagement, but I don't think as prevalent as others may think. Um, but I, I do believe that the way reimbursement goes in the state has also impacted that. There's an inequity in almost all, all the formulas and all the particularly charity care and all that. So access and quality gets impacted greatly. You have communities that go without care, um, although there hasn't been real studies to show when a hospital closed what was the impact in terms of the access. Um, but there's shown that over all the consolidations that have happened or, sell, or mergers or selling of property, most of it has not benefited the community at all. There have been real estate deals that have just made uh, – luxury housing, so it doesn't really um, doesn't help at all. I think part of it is also the, the ability for communities to be sitting and, and deciding and resources of how those resources get used in their community. And so I think the overall big issue has been um, the idea of, or a lack of community health planning and, and, and involving communities in the design and the decision. And that's been the big impact also around consolidations and mergers. Thank you, I wanna recognize Council Member Ayala has joined us. And I believe Council Member Barron, you had a question? Uh, thank you. And thank you to the panel for coming and sharing your information. So I had the opportunity to Google clear health costs. Um, and the site seems to be very straightforward. Thank you. Do you only rely on persons who share their data with you? Do you have, okay, so can you share with us how you? So yeah, so we're journalists. We do a pricing survey on common shoppable procedures as the core of our data set, 30 to 35 common procedures. Uh, we call providers and ask them their cash or self-pay rates. So what would they accept as a cash price for that MRI? That's right, without insurance. Okay. <clears throat> and then we uh, um, allow and we encourage people to contribute their data. We also have on the site um, the Medicare rates for every procedure in every one of every zip code, based on CMS data, 
As you probably know, the Medicare rate is the closest thing to a fixed or benchmark price in the marketplace. So if you look at the San Francisco MRI CPT code 72148, um, you can see that the prices there range from 475 up to $6,221, where Medicare pays 580. So you have something to navigate with. We didn't actually tell you how much your insurance company is gonna, gonna pay <coughs> or what your deductible did, but we do give you a way of navigating and having agency in the marketplace. So if somebody offers you a $6,221 MRI, you can say no thank you. So the uh, first panelist, Ms. Moran, uh, I believe you said that there are cost estimators that insurance companies use or project post, and it talks about the out-of-network costs? Um, it, it, they can use saying? cost estimators um, in a variety of ways, but they plans are required to have cost estimators on their websites. And a lot of plans are actually partnering with Fair Health, which you may be familiar with, um, which enables people to look at what their costs are going to be, what their out-of-pocket costs might be. So, Ms. Pinder, have you found that the cost estimators that are online or that are posted are accurate, <clears throat> or do they, conf do they match what it is that you have found? Uh, no, the online cost estimators by insurance companies mm -hmm. are uniformly terrible, and there's no accountability. Sorry. Thank you. Um, it is something that the governor has talked about creating kind of a, a universal cost tool. So why aren't they accurate? I really can't speak to that because I'm not intimately familiar with each plan's cost estimator. I mean, a lot of them... Um, you have to be a member to actually get your cost, but they also have a public facing, you know. So the cost might be different for different members? Uh, they could be based on what type of product they're in, mm. whether they're in a PPO or an HMO product. So there could be different costs. So the cost estimator wouldn't differentiate that based on? It, it should if you enter in all of the information. And again, I, I without actually looking at one and testing it, I can't speak to the uh, complete accuracy of them. Okay, thank you, thank you. So I think uh, Greater New York said it was the, like a list price and there's all these factors and it's like the back of the hotel door. And I'm wondering, I, I guess I wanna ask you specifically, Ms. Moran, is what role do insurance companies play in the pricing? Why do the prices, why do the prices vary in the same hospital? We don't play any role in hospital pricing. That is completely dictated by the hospital. Okay. Um, I wanted to just ask Anthony one follow-up to, to what you mentioned. And in terms of what kind of additional support would you like to see to help us kind of meet the needs of the community? We mentioned transparency, but you know, I also feel like w the conversation has led to whether or not did the transparency is actually going to be worth anything. So I wonder what are some of the resources or, or what additional support you would like to see to better meet the needs of your community. As an advocate, trans as an advocate transparency is always important um, for accountability. Um, just to mention the charges, list of prices can sometimes uh, um, underestimate as well. So, um, uh, so that's an issue. I think there really needs, and I'll be very honest, this is a political issue. <coughs> it's about who lobbies for the money and who lobbies for the resources and where it gets distributed and who, who makes the policy ch decisions. And so if we're going to have transparency, then it just cannot be the insurance plans in the hospital sitting at the table with the governor and deciding what needs to be happening. It needs to be labor. It needs to be community and thinking about the design and the formula. This is the same thing that's happening right now around charity care, um, changing the formula, you know, uh, to, to be more equitable across the board. So uh, there's a transparency issues across everything that uh, in terms of distribution of those dollars when it comes to the state. Um, I think the city council has the ability to uh, use this bully point to push back on some of these things. I think it's also to make sure we protect the public hospital system who are part of that two-tier two system where you have uh, people who are served and people who are not served within the system, and that plays out in costs also. 
and then quality of care. Um, I would think that we will look at some of the real, real property tax exemptions that the city gives to the hospitals. Um, I think we need to look at, um, like I men mentioned before, uh, a good yardstick to look at the payroll cost per adjusted discharges, to think that through. Um, that is one area. Um, I think every formula has its flaw. Uh, you're not going to get a perfect uh, assessment, but you really need communities to be able to understand the cost of their care um, and then the quality of that care um, all across the board. Mm. Thank you. Um, any more questions from the committee? Thank yeah. Okay, well, I just want to thank you. Thank you so much uh, for your testimony and for all of the work that you do and to everyone here. I don't think there are any more members of the public who wish to testify today. Okay, and with that, this committee meeting is adjourned. Thank you.